To, uh, I want to start here by, by, by asking you a few questions. We're, we're sure. going to try to do this in a, in a sort of a dialogue kind of way. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Atlas Shrugged. Uh, I've done many, 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 many presentations about the book. Uh, I'm as much a fan also of The Fountainhead, as much a fan of Anthem, as much a fan of, of, of many of the other novels. And as a matter of fact, I've actually done a little bit of reading on something called objectivism, which is the philosophy that, uh, that Ayn Rand uh, uh, tried to sort of name her, her, her philosophy objectivism. Could you tell us a little bit about, first of all, why the, the name objectivism? Uh, secondly, secondly, maybe, maybe, maybe a few words for those of us that aren't familiar with sort of the basics. Maybe you can do a... a, a yeah, so, so let me start with the basics and then we'll get to the name. Because okay. I think the name will make more sense once we understand the basics. So, for, for, in Ayn Rand's philosophy, reality is what it is. Now that sounds kind of obvious, but many philosophers in the history of philosophy have said, no, our consciousness creates reality or reality is imposed on us by an external consciousness, by God or something, and they can, they can make a change at any time. A is A, a very Aristotelian term from Aristotle. For Ayn Rand, reality is what it is. There's a law of identity, there's a law of causality that's immutable. It's independent of our consciousness. But we have a tool to understand reality, and this is, and it, this is our reason, our faculty of reason, our faculty. To, we can observe reality, we observe reality as it is, um, and we can understand it, we can integrate it, and as a consequence, we can reshape it. This table didn't exist before some human being took elements in reality and created a table. So reality isn't what, uh, so the way you learn truth about the world is not through your emotion, it's not through mystical revelation, it's through the use of your reason. And really this is where the term objectivism comes from. Subjectivism so relates to the fact that reality is objective, it's independent of our consciousness, and we know about the world by using reason to identify this reality. That's what's objective about it. Objective relates to facts, to, to actual reality, to what's out there. Now, so that's kind of the, 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 the philosophical, epistemological, and metaphysical basis. I know those are, are big words for business students. Um, they, I'm a business guy, so I'm not, I'm not a philosopher. Uh, but what does this mean? It means that if reason is how we know reality, if reason is a tool by which we survive as human beings, who reasons? Who, get, who thinks? Who uses their mind? Only the individual does. There's no group consciousness. There's no group reason. There's no group think, in spite of some business... Uh, uh, business theories that try to suggest there is, we each have to think as individuals. So, as a consequence of that, our survival, our pursuit of values, is dependent on our own use of reason. So, for when the whole, the whole moral focus is on the individual, it's on what's good for the individual, and that's that she's for self-interest. She rejects the idea that the purpose of life is to serve other people, it's to sacrifice, it's to live for the group, for the collective, or for your neighbor. But she also rejects the idea that other people should serve you, that they should sacrifice for you. No, we should each be independent people living our lives for the purpose of our own happiness, our own fulfillment, and ultimately our own flourishing. And here she follows Aristotle's kind of, uh, Aristotle's, uh, again, ethical code where the whole purpose of morality is to achieve eudaimonia, which in Greek means something like happiness or flourishing. Your own, not the groups, not other people's, but yours. And then the, the whole problem of morality is, how do you live a good life? Morality should teach you how to live a good life. Should give you the principles, the ideas of how to live a good life. Now, what political system is appropriate for an individual who must use his reason to live a good life? Well, a s political system that leaves the individual free to do so. Because we need to be able to use our reason and follow our values. We might be wrong, then we learn from our mistakes. We might be right, but if nobody else can tell us, oh no, that's not a good value, don't pursue that. They can't force us. So political system free of coercion, which is capitalism. Uh, so she rejects any form of coercion, both on the left or on the right. 
and she believes in a system of government that separates state from ideas. The state has no ideas. It doesn't indoctrinate ideas. The state has no economics. It doesn't have an economic policy. It doesn't promote economics. It doesn't repress economics. It's a separation between the state and economics. The state doesn't educate. The state doesn't do science. The state does one thing and one thing only, and that is uh, protect us, protect, uh, protect our rights, protect our freedoms from foreign invaders. You know a little bit about that. Um, from crooks and criminals, and as a judiciary to arbitrate disputes other than that it stays out of our lives, leaves us alone. Okay, you're, you, you've just, that's the whole, philo yeah, uh, you know. You just picked up a whole bunch of questions. I, I can imagine. That, um, that, that, I'm not sure if this, if this mic is working. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, that there's going to be a whole bunch of reaction out of the, out of the audience because Good. I saw I hope saw a whole bunch of eyes go up. <laughs> so what I'm going to let what I'm going to ask you to do is is formulate your questions and I'm going to open up the floor to a lot of questions. But as the moderator, I'm going to use my own self interest for about ten minutes and I'm going to try to ask a couple of questions uh, myself if that's okay. All right. And the questions that I have actually don't relate to the separation of the state from economics yet. Okay, we'll get to that. Good. And the role of the state. We'll of course get to that because one of the issues of, if, in Ukraine is you picked up one of them and that's judiciary. We'll get to that. You, your statement was that Ayn Rand is talking about, the Rand is talking about let's, every person should be mm, interested and in living a life that is of self-interest. Neither, and, and we all remember, those of us that have read the book, we remember Galt's um, oath. Oath, yes. The word was klatva. The Galt's oath, oath which was, um, I will always, you know, never, never ask another to live, live for me, nor shall I live for another man. Um, approximately, just a little under two years ago, uh, a kilometer and a half from here, a mile in your terms, um, a couple of things happened, right? Uh, or rather started. We call them Maidan. And for three months, people froze, people stood, people protested. And I would challenge that probably most people in this room had some, if not, if not physical, then emotional attachment to that event. And that was about being selfless for a cause. It was about being selfless for the cause of freedom. Uh, but it was very much about self-sacrifice uh, and collective sacrifice. Yeah. So how do we, I mean, in order to get to collect, in order to get to individual freedom, we have to get through self-sacrifice. That kind of sounds like original sin. I mean, that's, a, that's the bad way of doing things, isn't it? Well, I mean, I reject the premise. That is, I, I don't agree that it's self-sacrifice. I don't agree that it's, uh, that it's selfless. Those people out there, just like any fighters for freedom, including the founders of America, who, who are clearly individualists, are fighting for themselves, for their freedom, for the values they believe in. Um, what's the point of, of having a philosophy of self-interest if the state is going to tell me what to do? If, a pre if I'm going to be oppressed, then I don't need, I don't need a morality of self-interest that I'm going to be oppressed. The, 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 the only society in which it, morality is meaningful, that morality has meaning, is a society that is free, where I can express myself. So fighting for freedom is selfish. It's a requirement. I'd say, you know, I don't believe in moral duties, but it's as close to moral duty as you get. It's a requirement of a, any self-respecting person with self-esteem is going to fight for their own freedom and for the freedom of the people they love and they care about, which includes a lot of people. I care about a lot of people because I, I think there are a lot of good people out there. But it's, it's, I care about them because they're a value to me, not in and of themselves. So I believe that, that, that most revolutions for freedom are selfish. Um, you know, the Founding Fathers, and, and I, I mention the Founding Fathers only because I know that history, and I don't know Ukrainian history, so... I mean, they, they signed the Declaration of Independence. The odds were, if, if you were betting, if you were betting, you would bet, clearly the odd makers in London would have predicted, well, London was biased, but the odds maker in Las Vegas would have predicted that they would all die. If Las Vegas existed. Yeah, well, of course it did, but, uh, you know, that they would all die. 
Right? And indeed, at the bottom, they said, we are signing, we, we, we acknowledge that we are risking our life, our honor, our life, and our property for this. But they also realized that a life lived as a slave, a life lived as a serf, is not a life worth living. Right? So fighting for freedom is something you're willing to risk your life for. Fighting for freedom for yourself and for the people you love is a selfish, self-interested act. And indeed it would be irresponsible if you had the choice between serfdom and freedom not to fight for freedom. I would say it would be immoral if you had that choice not to fight for freedom. So freedom is not optional. It's not like, ah, yeah, freedom's nice but I can do without it. No. Freedom is necessary for human flourishing. So you have to fight for it. And, and yes, you, you risk your life for it. I mean, I'm not big at committing suicide for it, but risking your life for it, risking your life in a significant way like the founders did, absolutely. I view that as completely selfish. So what about what about those people around us that don't have the ability to fight for freedom? Oh, um, you promote it in the way that you can. Well, right? Look, I mean, hey, <laughs> Rand didn't have any kids. I got four. Do I have a responsibility to them? Sure. Sure. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not telling you that it's your moral responsibility to go out into the streets and risk your life when you have four kids at home and you need to feed them. You have to make that evaluation. Actually, I was looking at it the other way. Okay. Um, okay, if, I'm way? Not, if I have no obligation to live for another man or to live for anyone yeah. else, what about the obligation to feed my kids? You certainly have an obligation to feed your kids, and, and, and the reason you have an obligation to feed your kids is you chose to take on that obligation. Uh, whether you like it today or not, whether you like your kids or not, right? I hope you do. I do. You Excellent. <laughs> okay. um, but let's say you didn't, right? I, I, I've signed a lot of contracts, and I'm sure you were, you were in business, you signed contracts, later you regretted them. Tough. You signed the contract. Having kids, and uh, maybe I shouldn't say this, this is a religious country, but one of the reasons I'm pro-abortion is because I believe that signing that contract of having a kid is a big, big commitment. You should have as many outs as possible out of that. So, once you have the kid, you know, you, you sign an obligation to feed them and clothe them and educate them for the next 16 years, and, and it's your moral responsibility to live up to that, even if you change your mind in the middle, it's a contract. So, that's just the way it is. Uh, that's why I urge you, before you have kids, think about it a lot. Make sure you want them. Make sure you're going to love them. Uh, make sure you're with a partner that's probably going to be with you for a while because, uh, you know, kids in divorced marriages are not that great. Um, you know, they don't do that well. It, it's unpleasant for them. It, it's an important decision, and it's a contract you're signing for 18 years. In business, we rarely sign a contract for 18 years. Here's a contract for 18 years or 16 years or whatever. But, you see, I don't view, and it is related, you didn't really ask this, but I don't view what we do for our children as sacrifice. Because if we really love our children, they are very high value. So if I don't go to the movies and I stay with my kids, it's because I love my kids more than I love the movie. Right? So, and, and, and I've got this contract. So, it's not a sacrifice. I, I view, uh, I try never to sacrifice in life. So never to give something and not expect anything in return. I always expect something in return. And for my kids, I get a lot of pleasure in return. Now, they're adults now, so uh, it, it's more iffy about the pleasure. But uh, no, I, you know, I'm very proud of my kids, and my kids are, are fantastic. Um, and uh, and they pursue their passions, which is what I taught them to do. Okay, so I, I'm pro I, I promise I'm not going to monopolize this conversation. Okay, so we've done we've done sort of general epistemology, philosophy, that sort of thing. We went to Maidan. We've talked about kids. I want to go back to politics for a second, and then I'm going to open up. Uh, sure. I'm going to open up the floor to business. Okay, so you're, you'll, you'll ask the business questions because I have a feeling that there might be a few business questions. Um, the, the 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 politics, the role of the state that you mentioned, and that is a very limited role, and that is to maintain order. In other words, police, army, and to be some sort of a, a an arbiter of disputes. Yeah. Right. Well, what do you do? in a country like this one, where people trust each other, but don't trust the state. And one of the things that we're doing right now, which I think is, is probably, most people would agree is successful, is bringing in a new kind of policing. But uh, we still have a massive problem with creating that really just arbiter, sure. which is called 
um, which is called the, uh, the, the the judiciary. In fact, I think most of the people would, that would be reading at the shrugged would be seeing uh, Wesley Mooch. Yeah, everywhere. In a lot of judges, yeah. right? Um, and they'd be seeing a lot of of, uh, of Taggart, of James Taggart, in a lot of judges as well. Yeah. So um, how 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 does that work? I mean, the well, I mean, transitions are messy. And transitions are difficult. There's no secret formula. You just snap your fingers, everything's fixed. But you're not going to have a free country without an independent judiciary. I mean, to me, the foundation of freedom is is a, is is a rule of law, an objective law. And for that, you need an independent judiciary. You need a judiciary that's not corrupt, and that is not corrupt either from the side of, let's say, the business activity, or corrupt from the side of politics. Politics it has to be independent. Now, if you have a lot of corrupt judges, I would fire them all. <laughs> Clean house. And appoint new ones. And make sure, like in the, in the United States... The, oh, sorry, appoint or elect? Well, I think that's open. Uh, you can, you know, in America, for example, some are appointed, some are elected. There's no empirical evidence that I know of that the states that do appointment are better than the states that do election or other way around. So I'm not sure it's cr critical. As long as somebody's elected, right, that pointer needs to be elected. And as long as uh, many of the judges are more local than they are federal, that is, it could be at the local level that they're appointed, it shouldn't be all be elected by, it, it shouldn't be all be appointed by the federal government. That is a recipe for disaster. You want to make it local. But the important thing is to have, so, so one is to have a new set of judges. But what you really need are laws. Because that's, that's the evaluation. And the law should be clear so that you could read them as a business student and understand them. So you don't have to have a law degree to get them. And they should be objective in the sense that they relate to reality and, and can be interpreted justly. So that when there is a judge that's corrupt, you can say, look, here's the law, right? It's not this hard. It's not that hard. You're clearly way off and somebody can kick him out or impeach him or unelect un him, right? Elect him out of office. So, I, to me, if, if I were coming to a country like Ukraine and, and as an advisor, the first thing I would try to fix is the judiciary. Because again, you, 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 and, 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 but, but not just the judiciary, also the laws, and, and what laws? Primarily the laws that define property rights and contracts. Those are the most important laws for business, the most important laws for day-to-day -day activity. You want to define what property is, how it's exchanged, who owns it, under what terms, what they can do with it, and so on. You want to define them in clear terms. And then you want to, want to define clearly what a contract is and how it's arbitrated and so on. And then you want, to, you, you want to, as many judges as you could trust to get in there. And partially maybe firing them all, even though some of them are good, it, it addresses this issue of trust. Because at least it's a clean slate. We don't yet not trust these guys because they're new. Um, and I would start with that. And then, you know, if you ask me, I would have a whole series of programs on how to, how to fix the economy and get it going. And I, I think they're all simple. I, I actually think economic growth is one of the simplest things and, 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 and most understood things, and yet nobody, nobody in the entire world, except maybe a few countries in Asia, practice it. Um, uh, you know, people, people have a great ability to ignore the obvious. And the other thing I'll say is nobody... Actually, not, nobody's an exaggeration. Almost nobody learns from experience. We like to say we learn from experience, but nobody actually does. <laughs> People repeat the same mistakes over and over again, which is what Einstein called, you know what Einstein called that? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That was the definition of insanity, according to Einstein. If that's true, this world is nuts. It's completely insane. All our politicians are insane. And most of us are, because we just think of your own life. How many times you've made the same mistake over and over again, and you refuse to learn from the, from the last time you did it. See, now you're going back to my four kids. Um, <laughs> see, I stopped it too. I figured that out. <laughs> What's the, uh, what, what, is the, what are the basics of the obvious for the economic growth? The basics, the, 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 the obvious is freedom. Every country, Every country that has allowed its population economic freedom, respect for property rights, respect for contract law, and left people alone has thrived. And my favorite example of this is Hong Kong. I don't know if anybody's been to Hong Kong. I, I tell every audience I speak to, you've got to go once in your life to Hong Kong. Um, 
So here's a place that 75 years ago was a little fishing village. There was nothing there. It's a rock. There's no natural resources, nothing. And the British came there and they established the rule of law, British legal system, property right protection, much better than in England because they kept the 19th century version rather than the socialist version of the 20th century. And, then, and that's it. Hands off. No, no safety net, no nothing. Just, just we protect property rights, we protect contract law. And millions of people came from all over Asia, the poorest people in the world, no skills, nothing. Today, Hong Kong has more skyscrapers than New York City. The GDP per capita, which is a measure of wealth per capita, it's not the greatest measure, but it's a measure, is the same as the United States. So it took Hong Kong 70 years to do what the United States took it 200 and something years to create. And the United States has natural resources, Hong Kong has none. All you need to do, and this is what China discovered, it, it started out in the south of China, near Hong Kong, and they said, okay, we're going to do an experiment. We're going to let them, give them freedom and give them what a pseudo property right. We're going to pretend they have property rights and let them pretend. Boom, you go there and Shenzhen and Dongguan and Guangzhou, a skyscrapers, industry. Dongguan makes 50% of all the shoes in the world. Shoes you're wearing are probably made in Dongguan because of freedom. And China today, over the last 30 years, this is a statistic nobody talks about, over the last 30 years, one billion people have come out of poverty. One billion people have come out of poverty. In India, in China, in South Korea, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, in Thailand, any place that's adopted capitalist, capitalism, even a little bit, but of course the more the better, boom, wealth is created and the poor benefit proportionally more than anybody else because they go from starving like they did under Mao to middle class or potentially middle class so uh, it, it's basically freedom now how do you implement freedom uh, you know it means in a country like Ukraine I, uh, it means privatization on mass not a little bit not just the Ukrainians open the capital markets up let Germans in, let Americans in, let anybody, I guess, except Russians, in, <laughs> and let them let them buy Ukrainian land, let them buy Ukrainian We've been banks. For 20 years, so yeah. give yeah. other people a chance. Yeah, okay, let, you know, let them buy up the country. It's great. They're pouring capital. They're bringing the management expertise. They're bringing the business expertise. They're bringing, you know, growth. Open it up. Privatize. Deregulate. Eliminate regulations in business. Lower them significantly. And then a tax system that's flat, simple. Uh, you know, I think I think Estonia has a good model for for flat tax. Uh, unfortunately, even Russia has a model for a good flat tax. It's got a flat corporate tax, a flat uh, individual tax, no VAT, no complicated, messy stuff from business taxation. And I bet you, you do those three things: privatize, dereg low regulations, flat tax. And there's no reason the Ukrainian economy, given where it is today, can't grow at 5, 6, 7% GDP growth. Now you're talking about becoming a developed country very, very quickly, and, and a rich country. And, and if you want to defend yourself against the Russians, get rich. It's the best defense, right? Because that, you know... Uh, let's open up the, uh, the, the floor a little bit. Does, does anybody have some, some questions? Because we made some assumptions here that everybody is, is very much familiar with the philosophy of Ayn Rand and libertarianism and, 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 and objectivism and, and his ideas. And we've sort of, we, the first half an hour, we got into a very sort of, uh, I guess, pretty, pretty complicated discussion. If there's people that want us to sort of step back a little bit, that's fine. Uh, we can do that. Or if you've got questions that relate to your business or to your personal lives or to politics, now's the time to ask them. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Vera. Uh, six years ago, uh, I read uh, Atlas Shrugged, and it made me uh, join the Libertarian Party of Russia. And I was the first elected official from that party, and later I moved to Kyiv for obvious political reasons. And uh, when, uh, three years ago, uh, there was a kind of civil uprising in Russia that unfortunately didn't end up uh, the same way as 
here in Ukraine. Uh, uh, Atlas Rock was a very uh, popular book, uh, and now in Ukraine I see that many uh, young people are involved in Ayn Rand and objectivism and in libertarianism. So uh, my question is, do you connect the popularity of Ayn Rand books with uh, kind of like uh, the uh, people's uh, willing willingness uh, to? Uh, live in a free country, and uh, where in the world uh, you think uh, her books are more popular? And another question, sorry, may I ask two? Why don't you do the first one first? Because yeah. I can't remember both of the one. <laughs> so the first I'm, first. Getting, I'm getting old. Um, so, is there a connection between Ayn Rand's books and kind of movements to, to, to uh, freedom? I don't, I, I hope so, I, I think so. But, but, you know, there were movements towards freedom before Ayn Rand. I mean, let's, let's put it in perspective, right? Ayn Rand, the, 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 there's all, the, you know, the Founding Fathers existed without Ayn Rand. Um, and and there have been many movements over history that have wanted real freedom and, and economic freedom. What Ayn Rand gives you is, is, I think, a sense of moral certainty, moral confidence. And she gives the liberty movement, we'll call it in a general sense, a philosophical foundation, for, in my view, for the first time in human history. I mean, John Locke tried that, but he's weak in, in many of his philosophical assertions. I think Ayn Rand solid, gives it a solid, for the first time in history, the idea of freedom is solidly defended philosophically. So I think that'll give freedom movements, as we move into the future, a, a, a greater passion, greater stability, and greater influence. Because, and I don't know how much history we want, but if you think about the Enlightenment, the European Enlightenment, which really led to all the freedom movements and, and led to all the good things in life, uh, they, were, they, they had a weak foundation. And, and I think what, what Ayn Rand does is she's an Enlightenment philosopher. She's an, she solidifies the Enlightenment and gives us the ability to establish freedom in a way that's more sustainable than it has been in the past. Um, I am <coughs> delighted and um, fascinated by the fact that Ayn Rand is so popular in Russia and in, in Ukraine, and generally in Eastern Europe, I'd say right now, Poland, uh, all the way down to Bulgaria and Serbia. Uh, the, the Serbian translation of Atlas Shaw came out a few couple of years ago, and now they're translating Fountainhead and uh, Virtue of Selfishness which is a non-fiction book of Ayn Rand's, uh, there really seems to be a, a big surge in popularity in, uh, with Ayn Rand in, in Eastern Europe, which I think is fabulous and, and very exciting, because I think there's a huge amount of potential, because you guys know, much better than we do in America, the evil of socialism. You get it, because you've lived it, right? And I think you're, you're, you, know, you've, you know the evil of fascism. I mean... You lived that, or your parents or your grandparents lived through the evil of fascism. And, you know, you, you've got you've got a, a bit of a, of that on your on your eastern border right now. Um, so you know how bad things can be. I, I mean, we in America. You know, I'm not originally from America. I, I'm originally from Israel. So I, so I I know a little bit more about the world than I think most Americans do. Americans are pretty uh, lazy. Life is good, you know, and, and if it's deteriorating, economic growth is not there and jobs aren't, it's still good, right? We get, we get a new iPhone every year, we get Apple TV, I've got an Apple Watch, you know, things are good. Why worry about freedom? These are abstract concepts. In fact, we're losing freedom in America at, at, a, at a fast rate. Nobody worries about it because life is too comfortable. Life's not comfortable for you. You know the threats. You've lived them. Within a generation or two, you've lived all of them. So I think that's why there's a certain existential angst in Eastern Europe. And I think when there's that angst, people are searching for answers. And I think Ayn Rand presents answers. You agree with them or not? She presents a point of view. It, people like to engage in that when they're challenged. I think in America, again, people are, it's, a little, it's a little too lazy. Oh, why should I engage in new ideas? You guys need new ideas. You know you need new ideas. She presents some, engage with them. You like them, great. You don't like them, fine. But at least engage. Um, so I think at the margin, there's probably some influence. Certainly uh, things like uh, Students for Liberty and the growth of, of, of certain libertarian uh, forces 
uh, within Europe and even in America are the direct consequence of Ayn Rand. I mean, there was a, there was a libertarian, I don't know how many of you know about libertarianism, but there, there was a book written a long time ago in the United States called It All Begins with Ayn Rand. It's not a very good book. But basically that it was, if you're a libertarian, you almost always started with Ayn Rand to become a libertarian. And I think that's true. I think that's why we've got a large libertarian movement in the United States and in Europe and in South America and even in the beginnings of it in Asia. Uh, Ayn Rand is essential for that to happen and, and, and she, is, she is making those ideas more popular. And, and again, you can see with ESFL, with the European Students for Liberty, where Ayn Rand has a significant voice. Just as a point of information, um, these two couches, uh, many, many years ago, this would have been about four years ago, I was sitting there, and the gentleman on this side would have been a, a, a person that probably his surname would have been recognizable to anybody in the room, uh, Petro Poroshenko. Uh, and, and one of the questions came up of, you know, what's your favorite book? Yeah. And interestingly enough, uh, one of the things that he, one of the authors that he mentions is Ayn Rand. Yeah. Uh, you may not see that as being uh, as voters, um, but um, uh, but that's that, and perhaps it started with Ayn Rand and it's gone in other places. She is, I mean, she is often beloved by people who hold a completely opposite philosophy. I will give you an example. I don't know how many of you know Oliver Stone. You know Oliver Stone. Yeah. He made the movie Wall Street. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, Oliver Stone is a committed Marxist. I mean, he will admit to being a committed Marxist. And uh, Wall Street is an excellent movie from a Marxist perspective, right? It's, it's, it's very, aesthetically, it's a good movie, but it's pure Marxism. The whole presentation is a Marxist presentation. Um, Oliver Stone's favorite book is The Fountainhead. <laughs> and his dream is to make a movie of The Fountainhead. Now, I've read his description of the book, right? He would turn it into a Marxist book. Now, I found it is an anti-Marxist, anti-collectivist, pure individualist book. But Oliver Stone loved it, and yet would completely... So, people get all kinds of stuff out of Iron Man. Uh, half the Hollywood actors and actresses have said that Alex Shrugged is their favorite book, and then they go off and spew some leftist nonsense. <laughs> so, uh, it, it, she has an impact on people at some level, and sometimes that's all they get from it is some emotional response. You don't walk away from Ayn Rand neutral. It, it, it hits you in some way. And sometimes people misinterpret what she says. For example, the fountainhead is often misinterpreted as a as form of subjectivism, do whatever you feel like doing. Uh, that's all of the Stone's interpretation. But it always impacts people. Uh, uh, and and it, it's really interesting, all the list of people, celebrities, who say Ayn Rand is a, is a favorite author, The Fountainhead or Adler Shrugged is a favorite book. It, it, you know, it's one of the reasons. It's it's a it's a powerful experience. She had a second question. Yes, you had a second question. Have you forgotten? Maybe she yes. got. Uh, <laughs> second question is uh, that uh, I see it uh, as you as you mentioned that we in the Eastern Europe we had that uh, awful experience of uh, communism and uh, but uh, besides that uh, there are many people who still vote for. Uh, left uh, politicians for populists and those who are strongly convinced that individual liberty is very good, uh, they uh, do not connect it with economic liberty. What do you think is the, the uh, reason of this problem? Why it happens? So as I said, people don't actually learn from experience. <laughs> and the reason they don't learn from experience is because their philosophical ideas shape the way they interpret their experiences. So I know a lot of socialists who say, well, communism's never been tried. They didn't do it right. If only I had been in charge, it would have been perfect. Right? Uh, or, or that socialist country, Venezuela right now, it's a socialist country. People are starving in the streets. There's no toilet paper, there's no soap. Might remind you of, of, a, of a distant period in Ukraine's history. And yet nobody's learning, like Ecuador wants to be just like Venezuela. Uh, uh, Chile, the richest country in South America because of capitalism, has elected a socialist twice to become president. It's because it shaped our philosophy. So what is it about philosophy that prevents us from accepting that capitalism works and that socialism doesn't? Well, what are we taught in morality? What are we taught in ethics from when we're this big? We're taught that to be good means to sacrifice. To be good means to give. To be good means to share. To be good means to be selfless. 
Well, what political system is consistent with that? Socialism. It's very selfless. It's all about sharing. It's all about giving to each according to his needs, from each according to his ability. That's the morality of selflessness. Morality is much more fundamental than economics. So, people feel like socialism is right, it's just, it's fair, it's moral, it's an ideal. Capitalism is evil because capitalism is all about making money. For whom? For you. It's about pursuing your passion. Whose passion? My passion. It's egoistic. It's selfish. It's self-interested. So they, ugh, they don't, so yeah, you get skyscrapers, ugh, it's unpleasant. It's, 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 it's not a nice thing. And people vote their morality. There's a, there's a saying in America, in American politics, people say people vote their pocketbook. They vote pocketbook issues. Not true. People never vote economics. Never is again exaggeration, but they don't vote economics. People vote what they think is right, what they think is just. And the fact is, we live in the world in the West that believes that socialism is just and capitalism is unjust. There's a huge debate going on in Western Europe and in the U.S. about inequality. Right? Inequality is bad. Equality is good. Well, we've tried equality of outcome. We know how that turns out. Everybody's equally miserable. Have they learned anything from it? No. I say inequality is beautiful. Beautiful. You know, you, you get as much as you produce. Some people produce a huge amount. They, they, they make our lives better. They get rich. Some people produce a little bit, and that's okay too. You know, they get, you know, we're teachers. We know we're not going to be billionaires. Teaching until the internet really takes off. But it's an awful lot of fun. It is. Exactly. Exactly. So we're, we're, we've actually, I mean, we're probably smart enough to go out there and make some money, right? But we've, we've done a trade off. We love teaching. It's a lot of fun. So we're willing to take less money. So yeah, there's a huge inequality between me and the businessman who lives around the corner from me. Cool. He's doing what he loves. I'm doing what I love. That's great. That's inequality. is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. So people, but people, what they value, and if you want to ask me about inequality, I've got a book coming out in March about, it's called Equal is Unfair. We've got an okay. opposed unfair. There you go. Yeah, it's up there. Um, so, again, people vote what they think is right. And I'll give you this example, and then we'll take the next question. Um, rich people, you would think, want to keep their money, right? So the, the rich would never vote for higher taxes, right? If they purely voted economic interest, they would always vote for low taxes. But when Obama ran for president of the United States in 2012, he promised to raise taxes on the rich. Promised. And he, and he fulfilled that promise. How do you think the rich voted? Now, if they were voting economic interest, they'd vote against Obama. But they didn't. Eight out of the ten richest counties in the United States went for Obama. In California, we, uh, there was a, a referendum. Everybody got a vote on increasing taxes on the wealthy from 10% to 13%. That's on top of federal taxes. That's an addition. 10 to 13%. That's a 30% increase. How do you think rich people vote? For it because they think it's right, because they think it's just, because they feel guilty about all the wealth that they've created. And, and this is, I'm not talking about stupid wealth, I'm talking about Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley overwhelmingly voted to raise taxes on themselves. Because they vote morality, they don't vote economics. Uh, if, I, if I can jump in here, uh, I'm not seeing any hands, so put up your hands if you want if you want to ask more questions. But I'm going to jump in here because he's going he's gonna to dominate the, yeah, exactly, <laughs> dominate, because I'm having a lot of fun. Um, the, uh, the, the issue is that, that in, a, in the business school environment, we see this a lot of, um, of owners, business owners, asking themselves, is it right that my salary is 10 times higher, 50 times higher, 100 times higher than my cleaning ladies, right, or my other employees? I mean, they have a right to earn more, don't they? And it's a question that we get a lot of, um, and it's a question of guilt. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the guilt of success. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you about that because the, in, if we read about if we read Rand, it's really simple because she assumes that people that have money made it due to their own abilities. Yeah. What do we do with people that have laid an awful lot of money, but not necessarily due to ability? And I think that everybody in the room will will recognize who I'm talking about when I say think people like Ahmedov. 
Um, and, and, and I'm not, I mean, that's the most obvious one, right? Um, because there's very little ability there uh, in terms of perhaps those of you that have, have seen interviews would know. Um, and, and some of the other really, really, sure. really rich people in Ukraine, they're not the Hank Reardon types. Yep. I mean, they haven't developed a new metal. Uh, they're certainly not the types that have gone off and done some sort of huge innovation. They're not, they haven't made their money in the Silicon Valley way. So I, I think the best and most just way to deal with it is to create competition so that they lose all their money. Because stupid wealth doesn't last in a free market. Now, they does in a politicized market. In a corrupt market, they use the government to protect themselves. But if you take away that protection, and you, this is why I, I insist on inviting foreign capital in, create competition to your oligarchs, right? Let them compete. Let them feel like if they, if they don't work hard, they're going to lose their money. Make them, now you could have courts and, uh, you know, redistribute their wealth and stuff. That's very messy and very dangerous and, and, and prone to injustice because you'll, you'll, the real entrepreneurs will be sucked in with the bad entrepreneurs. The best way to do it is to create real competition and they'll lose their money. This happens everywhere around the world. When, when people don't really own their money and you create freedom around them, they lose it. Or they lose it within a generation. The kids lose it. Uh, so that would be my solution. Open up the borders. Let capital and talent come in and privatize, create a great, create a great business environment where anybody in the world say, oh, I want to go build that in Ukraine. And you, yeah, you laugh. But, but if you did that, imagine what it would be like, right? Because corporate taxes are low, people work hard, people, the smart people, the educated people, I want to go build a business in Ukraine. I just need to get rid of all these bureaucrats, you know, cut them off. Get, get rid of them. So that would be my solution to the oligarchs. There's a hand here. Uh, Yaron, thank you very much for your presentation. It's brilliant, really. I'm uh, Nikolai Vorobyov. I'm Ukrainian journalist, and I spend enough time in Washington, D.C., where we run our one think tank promoting Ukrainian interest in the United States. So I'm a bit familiar with the situation. Actually, I had the same question about the role of oligarchs in Ukrainian society because they are also person pursuing their own happiness and they really don't care about the society and they literally buy politicians and at the end of the day the politicians do what they, 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 they demand. And actually, as I know, the United States also faces with the same problem. It's a big issue in the United States. So what's your opinion about money and politics? Should it be split it off or, I mean, how to deal with this? How to fix it? Because money play a huge role. And lobbyists and all this K Street, all of this stuff. Sure. So maybe you can comment. Thank so you. Let, let me comment on something you said earlier first, and then I'll comment on that. I don't believe these people are pursuing their own self-interest. I don't think they know what their self-interest is. I don't think they, they, they use this in pursuit of their self-interest. They are emotional. They want power. They want money. They want power and money for their own sake. I doubt any of them are happy. Any of them are fulfilled. Certainly none of them are flourishing in the Aristotelian sense of the word. Uh, money does not equal flourishing. Money, power, certainly does not. People who, you remember Ayn Rand's oath you know, don't live off of other people. What does it mean to buy off politicians? It means you're leeching off of other people. Leeches. You know what a leech is? Yeah. Your, sucks your blood. It's an it's a, it's a organism that sticks to your skin and sucks your blood. Yeah. That's a leech. In economics, a leech is somebody who uses politics to suck money. Right? That's force. That's I, I, wanting you to sacrifice for them. That doesn't lead to happiness, it doesn't lead to success. It leads to money and power. Money and power do not equal happiness and success. I don't know anybody who's got power who's really happy. Political power I'm talking about. Now how do you deal with it? The only way in my... I, so I, I don't believe in getting money out of politics. I think that's a disaster because that's an issue of free speech. The fact that I've got all the money doesn't mean you can silence me. If I want to use my money to make political statements, if I want to make, or use my money to make lots of political statements, I have every right to do that. It's an issue of freedom of speech. The only way to, 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 to reduce cronyism, to reduce the involvement of business in politics, is to shrink politics. It's to make politics impotent. 
to make politics impotent. So if politicians can't regulate business, why would I bribe them? So in the 19th century America, when America had small government and wasn't involved in every aspect of the economy, there was very little cronyism. Even 50 years ago, there was less cronyism than today. The reason there's a lot of cronyism today is because government regulates everything. And I'll give, you, I'll give you my favorite example of this. In 19... I think it's 1994, uh, the top executives of Microsoft were invited to the Senate in, in the United States. And they sat there in front of the Senate, and the, the, the Republican, this is a Republican, not even a Democrat, Arlen Hatch is a Republican senator from Utah. He, he yelled at them, and he said, you have got to start lobbying. You've got to build a building in Washington, D.C., You've got to realize we, Washington, is important. And the guys from Microsoft says, look, we don't need you. Just leave us alone and we'll leave you alone. We don't want to lobby you. We don't need you. We're, we're developing the most innovative software in the world. We're changing the world. Literally, Microsoft changed the world. We don't need you. Leave us alone. Guess what happened a year later? The Justice Department goes after Microsoft. Why? <laughs> Because they dared to offer a product for free. Talk about the evils of, of monopolies, right? They might offer you something for free. How, how bad is that? Uh, so what did Microsoft learn from that lesson? And, and of course, this dragged out for years, and they lost the court case, and they had a bureaucrat stationed at Microsoft for 10 years. Innovation went down. Apple went like this. Microsoft went like that. All because they refused to play the game. The game set by politicians. Guess how much they spent today on lobbying? Tens of millions of dollars. They've got a beautiful building inside Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, you could walk to the Capitol. You could walk to the White House. If you take away the power of politicians to regulate, to control, if you create a tax system that's flat, no deductions, you can't deduct anything. Revenue, expenses, or just tax revenue. Revenue, expenses, and that's it, right? Then why should I lobby? You, you don't control anything. Now I have to run my business. So the only way to stop cronyism, the only way to stop this oligarch-type relationship, the power relationship, is to make politics impotent. And you do that by having a simple tax and by eliminating regulation, minimizing the regulation to really the protection of property rights. That's it. You don't need government to do anything more than that. The marketplace can take care of it. Do I really need the marketplace to tell me what taxi to take? No, Uber is a great example, right? Uber, I can rank the driver, the driver can rank me, uh, the, driver can rank me the marketplace is taking care of all of that. That's why there's a big fight in America right now about Uber, and in Paris, and in London, I don't know about here. But there are fights everywhere because the taxis, who are government controlled and government regulated, are saying well, this is unfair, and it's right, it's not fair. We should stop regulating taxis. Not stop regulating Uber, stop regulating taxis, because we don't need the regulators. We can regulate ourselves. So that's what Uber has proven to us. <coughs> I don't see any hands. I can monopolize. <laughs> wow, I mean, okay. I said um, stuff you must disagree with. Well, yeah, to challenge me. There we go. Uh, there's a hand? Okay, all right. I was going to go on the taxi bit, but okay, go ahead. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for the pleasure. lecture. Uh, do you think with the Elon Musk uh, ideas to install all those Tesla, all those Tesla batteries, and all those uh, uh, self-producing energy systems, will that bring us to the world when we do not need a government at all? Because my house will be heated, uh, my telephone will be recharged, uh, who the hell should I pay in the taxes? What will it happen just in 20 years' time if we actually do not need the um, at least heating and uh, electricity and water and anything like this? Thank you. But, uh, yeah, but think about it this way. I mean, in America, uh, I buy my electricity from a private company, not from the government. I buy my water in some places from a private company. Now, the government unfortunately regulates those. Uh, but they would be better if they didn't. 
Um, almost all, all the heating, all of that today in America, it's private. I don't need Elon Musk, and, and I'll, I'll say something about Elon Musk in a minute. I have a lot to say about Elon Musk. What's that? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, so none of those things do, do we need government now for. We can privatize all of them, and you should privatize all of them. You don't need government to supply you with electricity. Thomas Edison was not working for the government. He was working for himself. Motivated by the profit motive. Motivated by his own passion for new discoveries and for ideas. Um, what do we need the government for? We need the government for the things that only a government can do. Which is guns. We need a government to protect ourselves. So that I don't have to carry a gun when I walk around the streets afraid of being mugged. I want the police force. I want the police investigating a murder. I want the police investigating. I want them to be good at it. I want them to be professional. And I don't believe in private armies and private police forces because I think all that generates is conflict and, and violence and the worst type of anarchy. So I believe that the government should be involved in guns. That's it. A military to protect us from bad guys overseas, terrorists, invaders, and a police force to protect us from each other and from fraud. And a judiciary, because we're going to disagree once in a while and we need somebody to be able to arbitrate disputes. That's it. And this is why I said separation of economics from state. International representation capital? What do you need international representation for? I believe tariffs should be zero, capital flow should be allowed, and immigration should be for the most part open. So why do you need an embassy in the United States under those conditions? I mean, okay, so we do. But is it that important? No. If Americans want to come here, great. If they want to send their dollars, even better. If they want to invest here, wonderful. So you see, the whole field of international relations, in my view, is a creation of statism. Oh, we're, you know, we've got alliances and this, the, you know, these powers and those powers. And, this is, and, and we're going to allow this industry to come, but not that industry, because these guys are... This is all... It benefits the elites uh, who control uh, the countries. I mean, if I were running America, I can't speak about Ukraine, but if I were running America, a lot of countries I wouldn't have embassies in. Why does the U.S. have an embassy in Saudi Arabia? I hate everything about Saudi Arabia. The way they treat their women, the way they treat their men. <laughs> I mean, it's a disgusting place. Why is America sanctioning the existence of Sharia law by having an embassy in Saudi Arabia. Should. Yeah. The, um, that sounds like a nationalism. It's not nationalism. I evaluate other countries based on their morality, based on whether they're good or bad. And some countries are bad and some countries are good. Oh, well, now we're getting to moral subjectivism. And this is good. Now we're getting to philosophy. Good. There is one standard for morality, and that is the standard of human life. If a regime, if a country, if a culture, right? You've grown up with multiculturalism, one of the most evil ideas in human history, in my view. <laughs> cultures are not equal. Some cultures promote human life. They encourage human life. They support human life. They thrive. We, and I have no idea why these ugly paintings are in here. And, and, and not only are they ugly, but they're scary, right? I mean, they're, they're malevolent. They got put up today. <laughs> They're really malevolent. So this is not a life-enhancing culture. That painting. Anyway, some cultures produce Michelangelo. Some cultures produce Newton. Some cultures produce Thomas Edison. Other cultures don't produce anything. They produce female genital mutilation. That is evil. That is not good. That's an evil culture. It's an evil country. A, a country where a woman can't drive is an evil country. You have every right as a human being to do whatever you think is good for you, independent if you're a woman or a man. That some king, the king of Saudi Arabia, can tell a woman she can't drive, or that she can't have sex, or that she has to marry into a polygamous situation, is, is disgusting, it's evil, it's immoral. There are cultures that are good and there are cultures that are bad. And, and, and I'm willing to criticize my own culture fanatically religious Jews, fundamental Jews, that is an evil culture. I de despise them. They treat women horribly. You know that every morning a man wakes up and says the first blessing he says is thank you God for not making me a woman. 
and they treat women that way. That's not, you, you can't say that's the same as, as normal culture in, in a Western country. Normal culture in a Western country is a million times better than fundamentalist Jewish or fundamentalist, you know, anything in my view. So, I don't buy multiculturalism. Uh, Michelangelo is not the same as some carving in, a, in, in tribal Africa. Sorry, one is great art and one is... Uh, I mean, we have to have values, we have to have scales. They're, not everything is the same. This is why I'm against equality. I, I don't believe equality exists. Some people are better, some people are worse. Some cultures are better, some cultures are worse. Some people are damn evil. Some cultures are evil. Judging is important in life. Judge and be ready to be judged. Right? It doesn't go one way, it goes both ways. That's life. She, she, she. Thank you, yet another... Uh, oh, I didn't say anything about Elon Musk, yeah. but remind me and I'll say something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, yet another humongous thanks and for the privilege of being here, a friendly professor of philology over here, friendly neighborhood <laughs> professor. Uh, I have a philosophical question, if you will. Uh, in view of the prior statement uh, that had to deal with a cultural divide, yeah. uh, my question is, in view of that, how different the cultures are, how different are the places that the cultures come from, ethically, uh, identity-wise, anything, how applicable is, in fact, objectivism to cultures that come from a fundamentally different place than the, the one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all? Hey, wait a minute. You do realize that, that Anna's name was Anna Rosenbaum? And then she came from St. Petersburg. Okay. Yeah, Ayn Rand uh, was born in St. Petersburg to a middle-class Jewish family. Um, I think very applicable. Uh, it, it, it's what will convert bad cultures into good cultures. I, I know I know Ayn Rand fans in Saudi Arabia. And they are fighting, just like you fought for freedom, they are fighting for freedom in Saudi Arabia. And hopefully one day they will have their revolution and they will get rid of a king. I thought we got rid of kings a long time ago and replace them with an elected body that protects their individual rights. As, the, as that document said, the document you were quoting, which is the Declaration of Independence, in my view the greatest political document in human history, all men are created equal. Equal not in a sense of equality of outcome, but in a sense of embodying freedom, embodying liberty, and if I would give it an epistemological essence, all men have reason. All men are capable, of, and women, of course, are capable of reason, right? Men, in Old English, refer to both men and women, um, which is pretty chauvinistic, but anyway. Uh, so, the idea, and, and of course the Founding Fathers got us wrong, right? Because they had slaves. But the fact that the document was written made it such a contradiction to have slavery and all men are created equal that they had to have a civil war. 600,000 people had to die to free the slaves. Um, so contradictions don't last. So I don't care if you're, if you're a tribesman in Africa, or a, 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 a peasant in China, or an intellectual in Ukraine. Human nature is human nature. And Ayn Rand's philosophy is consistent with human nature. It's consistent with man as a rational animal, which is Aristotle's term again. All of them are rational. All of them are only going to achieve values through reason. All of them need freedom and liberty in order to achieve those values. Capitalism is the only system that works. And here's the example, right? There was no capitalism in Asia, ever. When they tried a little bit of it, incredible success. In Taiwan, in South Korea, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, and now in China. They're not Westerners, but they respect individual rights to some extent, right? Japan. Uh, when, uh, when America occupied Japan after World War II, uh, the Americans asked the Japanese to write a constitution. And the Japanese handed General MacArthur a constitution based on Japanese principles. And General MacArthur said, this is crazy. This is a stupid constitution. It won't work. And he shredded it. And he, as an assistant, wrote the Japanese constitution. And it's the only constitution in the world that has the phrase, all individuals have the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness taken from the Declaration of Independence. And guess what? Japanese, Japan has done very, very well under a constitution written by an American general and his assistant. Because these are inalienable truths. They are reality for all men, Japanese, Chinese, Americans. 
doesn't matter. There's a superior culture, and that culture is the culture of the Enlightenment. It's the culture of man as a reasoning being. It's the culture of individualism. And if Africa adopts that culture, they will do fantastically well. If they don't adopt it, they will do fantastically bad. Your, your, your example is a little bit dangerous uh, because we have a, 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 another little guy that wants to write our constitution for us, but he's, his name is not MacArthur. Um, well, that's a question here. That's a problem. <laughs> um, my name is Elena, and I have actually two questions. So first one, um, you told that um, uh, migration should not be regulated. If it uh, wasn't regulated, for example, in Europe, Europe will be destroyed. Yep with uh, all the migrants all over the world. And the second one... So let me answer that and then you can ask me the second question. So in a free society, in a completely free society, and in a society that's not at war, and, and this relates to Europe, um, I believe immigration should be free. Now that doesn't mean citizenship. Is the, the citizenship and immigration is not the same thing. People should be allowed to come and work. Citizenship, you should, be, you should have a requirement for citizenship. A lot of years lived in a certain knowledge of the constitution and the system of law under which you're going to live. But let's take Europe right now. First of all, it's not, a, it's not free. Europe has an advanced, very lucrative, very, benefit, uh, uh, very corrupt uh, welfare state. So why are all the immigrants going to Germany and to Sweden? They don't want to go anywhere else. Germany and Sweden. Why? Because they know when they get to Germany, when they get to Sweden, they get a check. And then they get a home. The Swedes, there's a huge shortage of housing in Sweden. But the Muslims who come, they get a house. Right? So the welfare state is a magnet for... So you can't have a welfare state and open immigration. You have to eliminate the welfare state. And I, I believe in eliminating the welfare state. Then you can open up the borders. But the second qualification is you can't be at war. Now I believe, and this is controversial, but I believe, that the West is at war with radical Islam. It's a war we're afraid to name. It's a war we won't declare. It's a war we won't even fight. Right? But we're at war with them. So if you're at war with them, you certainly can't let them flood your country. So it's legitimate for Europe to say, look, you guys, we're at war with you. You can't come in. Just like Americans didn't accept Nazis into America during World War II. They said, oh, generally, you can come, but if you're Nazi, you can't come. Now, by World War II, even America closed off its borders. But, so, those would be like two qualifications. No welfare. And nobody from enemy territory can come. Like, it, would, it doesn't make sense for Ukraine at war with Russia to say, okay, Russians, you can come. Right? No, no Russians, because we're at war with you. After the war, we can talk. But as long as there's a war, as long as there's hostility, there's nothing to talk about. So those were two major qualifications about migration. Look, I don't know where your ancestors came from. But my, you know, uh, my children. My, I've got two sons. They were they were the fourth generation born on a different continent. We're wandering Jews. Uh, we've been immigrating for thousands of years. We haven't hurt anybody. We've been hurt by everybody. We haven't hurt anybody. My children were born in America. I was born in Asia, in Israel. My parents were born in South Africa. Go figure. Uh, and their parents were born in Lithuania. They were your neighbors. Uh, my wife's mother was born in Morocco. My wife's father was born in Palestine. But his grandparents came from Uzbekistan. So I have no sympathy for... I have a lot of sympathy for people moving around. I immigrated from Israel to the United States. And I think that's a good thing for me, and I, you know, I'm a little arrogant. I think it's good for America, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very tolerant regarding all this. I was born in Moscow, but I was living in Ukraine, uh, and then I was studying in, the, in Vienna. Yep. So I know what, like, a little bit about this thing. Okay, the, my uh, second question is um, regarding Elon Musk. So, he <laughs> changed industry. His ideas, he had different ideas in different spheres, and he really changed many industries. Uh, but he was uh, supported by Obama. And actually, if uh, uh, there was not Obama's support, uh, maybe some of the companies were bankrupt. Yep. So, what will you say? He's a corrupt businessman. 
He's, he's no different than your oligarchs. He's, he's a crony. Now, the first business he built where he made his first money was all private. That was PayPal. PayPal never had any government involvement, and that's how he made his fortune, his first fortune. But then, almost all of his investment have been in government-supported businesses. Now, I don't blame him too much for SpaceX. SpaceX sends rockets into space. The only client he has right now, because of the way the government does it, is NASA, is, is the government. But Tesla is a bad, bad, bad business. I don't like Tesla. I condemn anybody who buys the car. Um, and this is why. I'm subsidizing. Me? I'm a middle class American. And my taxes are going to Elon Musk, who's rich. He's a billionaire. He's taking my money and building cars that rich people buy that I'm paying for. But That's immoral. But he disclosed all the technology in order to build the industry. He disclosed everything. That doesn't make him a good guy. Why does that make him a good guy? Apple never disclosed any of their technology. Every patent that Apple is locked up. Is that bad? But Apple, okay. Is that Apple bad? Apple created uh, industry, but there was only one idea, okay? No, but they've got, they've got a hundred ideas. Think about Apple. Apple invented the personal computer. It invented object-based, um, mm -hmm. you know, where you where you use objects, a mouse, uh, using a mouse. Mm -hmm. uh, Apple invented, it, it really invented the iPad, the iPod, uh, turned the iPad into something, it invented the, the iPhone. Apple has invented millions of things, and they, and, they, and they don't, they don't unleash the technology and everything. That doesn't make them bad. So Elon Musk has every right to make this technology public, but that doesn't make him a good guy. The fact that he uses my money to subsidize his car uh, and, and, and to sell it to rich people at my expense, it's just wrong. It, it, you know, you want an electric car, pay the full price. Why are you taking my money to, to make it cheaper? Right? So the car sells for, I don't know, $80,000, it should sell for hundred twenty. Now if it sold for hundred twenty, Elon Musk wouldn't make any money at Tesla. As it is, Tesla doesn't make any money. But they would lose a lot and they would never be successful. Good. I think electric cars are stupid. But the, the just to continue with that, just to, to, to play devil's advocate for a second, um, what about the environment? And what about the fact that, yeah. the fact that Tesla is making cars that don't have emissions will make your grandkids healthier than your kids. So I have a lot to say about this. <laughs> but let me start by the myth. Tesla has no emissions? Where do you live? What is electricity? Where does electricity come from? Coal. Coal. The most filthy emission of all of them. I call Tesla cars coal cars. Not electric cars, <laughs> coal cars. Because to produce the electricity, you have to burn coal. There's no other way. In America, 50% of the electricity is made from coal. The most dirty of all forms of producing electricity. Or nuclear. Nuclear is very clean. But, but very little electricity in the United States is made. Is that's, nuclear. Tiny. That's, that's, your that would be right. my solution. Now, if you went nuclear and you produced, and, and you actually had the cost, now it's, it's a question of whether nuclear energy produces cheap electricity. That's a question. But if it did, then great. Then maybe then electric cars one day become. But right now, electric cars are coal cars. They emit coal. Those batteries, you know how much CO2 has to be emitted and how much pollution has to be emitted to make the batteries? So, so there's a, the whole environmentalist movement creates this mythology about what's clean and what's dirty that's complete nonsense. And, and we all buy it. We've all bought it. Everybody in the West buys it. It's complete nonsense. Recycling. I love recycling. Uh, you guys love trees? You like trees? Yeah. I like trees. Right? <laughs> Do you know that recycling destroys trees? In a free market. In, in America, it destroys trees. Why does recycling paper, recycling wood products, destroys trees? This is economics 101. Right? Trees, are, trees are renewable resources, right? Let me ask you another question. I'll get back to trees in a minute. If, you, if we all stop eating chicken, everybody stopped eating chicken in the world. Would there be more chickens in the world or less chickens in the less. world? Less. I think we better ask Yurko Kushuk. <laughs> <laughs> well, in America, that's one, the, that's one of the rich guys in yeah. Ukraine that sells chickens. They, there'd be less chickens because people would have less of an incentive to grow chickens. If we stopped using wood products tomorrow, would there be more trees or less trees? 
less. Why? People would have no incentive to plant trees. And indeed, the land that today is used to chop down trees and make a profit, we would say, it's a waste just being a forest. Maybe I can build a home there, or maybe I can build an industry there, or maybe I can build, use the land for some other productive resource. You know there are more trees today than there were 100 years ago in America? You know why? Because we use more paper. So we have to plant more trees so we can cut down more trees so we can use more trees. If I estimate that I will need more trees in the future than I do today, I will plant more trees because I'll need more trees to chop down in the future to supply demand. This is supply and demand, simple supply and demand. Right? And I will innovate. I will find ways to plant more trees on the same plot of land to, to create more density. Right? Now you say, yeah, but you lose old trees. Fine, but I don't really care about old trees that much. I just care about trees. And if you just care about trees, you want to use as much paper as possible. And you don't want to recycle. Because then demand will go up in the future and now plant more trees. This is just economic fact. But nobody knows it. Or, or recycling plastics and all the other recycling. You know that the pollution from the truck driving to collect all the recycling bins in California pollutes more than putting it all into a landfill. <laughs> Landfills are easy. You dig a deep hole in the ground and you fill it up with the plastic trash. The earth is huge. There's plenty of room for all that trash. Um, so there's a lot of mythology in, uh, in the environmentalist movement. Uh, what do we do about, uh, about I don't know, global warming? Is that, is that the issue of the day? No. No, I did a post on this the other day. Uh, in the recent Democratic debate, um, and I know, you, I know you don't like the Democrats, but uh, they, they were asked, the, the five Democratic candidates were asked, what is the largest threat to the national security of the United States, uh, largest single threat to the national security of the United States, and they all said climate change. Uh, nobody mentioned... Uh, the Islamic threat, nobody mentioned Putin, nobody mentioned anything like that, even though there are people out there that say that the United States is, is in fact their number one enemy. Um, can I just say that I think that's insane? <laughs> I mean, first of all, we don't know that climate change is happening. I mean, temperatures seem to be pretty flat in the last 12 years, but even if it's happening, you no, know, so what? So it gets a little warmer. I hear in Ukraine you could use that a little bit. Um, trees love CO2. With the more CO2 in the atmosphere, the more growth of greenery there is. The more food we get, the more algae there is, the more trees there are. Um, you know, Canada becomes habitable. <laughs> you Canadian? Right, you might actually go home. This is good. This is home, thanks. Yeah. Um, I don't get it. Uh, uh, you know, in, in, a long time ago, about 80 years ago, somebody invented this wonderful invention that solves the problem of climate change. It's called air conditioning. <laughs> I live in the desert. I live in Southern California on the edge of the desert. Right? It, we, we, the only reason there's green stuff and there's green stuff all over the place around where I live is because we, we water it. Right? In the so-called drought of California, we still water everything. Right, because there is no, because drought is a, it's and by the way, because of you, the Colorado River doesn't make it to the Pacific anymore. Well, who cares? <laughs> I mean, so a lot of fish so care. <laughs> I mean, so what? I don't care about fish. I, 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 I mean, what, really, nature is there to serve us, not for its own good. I mean, we, I mean, I'm selfish. I'm a self-interested person. Nature's there. So you like spotted owls? There was a big thing in America years ago. That's why I buy some. <laughs> and if you want a forest for spotted owls, buy a big forest. Don't let anybody develop it and grow spotted owls in the forest. But I don't like spotted owls. They don't taste that good. Um, no, but, I mean, nature's the, the way human beings survive. I'm, I'm being partially funny, but the way human beings survive is by changing our environment to fit our needs. If we stop changing our environment, we die as a species. Every other species adapts to its environment or, or dies. We don't adapt to our environment. We adapt the environment to us. So when we didn't like caves, we built mud huts. We took mud, which is environment, we changed it and built a hut. When we didn't like just picking berries and nuts, we developed tools to go kill animals. And then when that was inconvenient, we rounded up animals 
and put them in pens and grew them for food. That's what they do to chickens and cows and pigs today, right? We, 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 we want to build a, a skyscraper, we chop down a mountain and we take all the, 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 the bricks there and we, we, we build a building. We go underground to get coal and to get... That's how we as human beings live. So my response to, oh, we're changing the environment is, cool. <laughs> that's great. That's how human beings survive. That's how we live. Now, again, I value trees. I value nature. And there's plenty of it. If you fly over the United States, 90% of the United States is empty. There's plenty of nature out there. But do I care about another fish in the Colorado River? No, I don't. And the fact is that today, in California, I don't get, I don't get water because they are pouring water into the Pacific Ocean to save some little fish in some river near San Francisco. I'd rather take a shower. <laughs> I would. And I think it's better for civilization that I take a shower. <laughs> but the at least whole, corner of civilization. The whole, drought, the whole drought in California is politically made. Um, we could desalinate the ocean. There's a massive desalination plant in San Diego that produces all the water San Diego needs, but yet they have to cut water use because there's a drought. But in San Diego, there's no drought. But California has announced a drought, so they have to cut water use. But we could build 10 desalination plants and fix all the water problems in California. It's expensive. Why? Because electricity is expensive in California. Why? Because we're shifting electricity from natural gas to alternative energies, which are much more expensive. So electricity is very expensive, so desalination is expensive. In Orange County, where I live in California, we have the largest plant for water recycling in the world. They collect all the rainwater, they collect the sewage water, they treat it, they, and they recycle it, and they bring it back. We don't have a drought in Orange County. We have plenty of water, because we, we, we're very efficient at using the water that we use. Can I just ask you something? Yeah. Those facilities that you just talked about, yeah. the desalination plant, yeah. uh, the water treatment plant, etc., aren't those run by the government? No, the, uh, the desalination plant for certain isn't. It's, it's run by private enterprise. But they're run by local governments. I mean, no, these, are, no, no. these are usually public-private partnerships. No, well, only because the government forces it on them. But I think, I'm pretty sure, and, and you know, I might be wrong, but I think that desalination plant in San Diego is private capital. Okay. It, it's a private-public partnership because to hook into the water stream, you have to go public. But there's no reason the water pipes couldn't be privatized. I mean, that, that's just a... Again, a phenomenon of government. Um, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up here a little bit, but I have a question. In the oh, back. sorry, there's a question. I missed it. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. If you don't want him to wrap up, then just raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello, my, my name I is Thomas. Go all night. Yeah. Very interesting lecture. I'm basically Austrian, um, and I wanted to know two things. Like, do you generally think that all subsidies on environmental stuffs are kind of a waste of money? Um, and I would like to know what you think about the Swedish model because Sweden is like kind of this um, almost perfect society, high taxes, uh, very strong middle class. Uh, people actually, wherever you go in the world, you meet more Swedish people traveling around than Americans. Um, There's also kind of <laughs> cultural stuff, I would say, but um, what do you think about the Swedish model? Well, I've got a lot to say about Sweden. Um, and, it, and it's actually a couple of videos. I, I was actually, last year I was in Norway, in Bergen, and I gave a speech at the University of Bergen about the evils of the Norwegian welfare state. It was a lot of fun. Um, what was the first question? Oh, subsidies. I'm against all subsidies. All subsidies. You, again, you want to preserve a particular environment. You want to preserve the rainforest. You want to preserve a particular part of the ocean. And I'm not being, I'm not kidding you. Buy it. The solution to all environmental problems, or almost all environmental problems, is private property. And there are funds in the United States. There's a large fund in the United States that goes around the world and buys and turns into private property uh, endangered, uh, uh, you know, ecosystems. And that's, yeah, that's great. As long as you're using the private property model, you're not stealing my money. You know, go preserve your spotted owls and your smelt and your fish and whatever. By the river. I believe rivers should be privatized. If the river out here was private, it would be clean. Because you know what? My backyard is very clean. <laughs> but public property is typically dirty. 
because it doesn't. Nobody owns it. Nobody cares about it. So if you want it, and, and there are ways to privatize rivers in the old west in the United States. They used to have water rights, and they privatized rivers, and they determined what to do about the fact that one guy's cows would poop at the top of the river, and you were trying to drink from the bottom. And how do you arbitrate those? There's a whole theory. And Ronald Coase was a famous economist in Chicago who wrote a lot about this. But there's a lot of theories on how to deal with that. But that's ideal. If you could, if you could privatize lakes, rivers, and the oceans, it would be wonderful. It, they would be clean and there'd be lots of fish because there's no, there's no private incentive to, to, to destroy all the fish. It goes back to chicken, right? Because we privatize chickens, there's more chickens. If we privatized fish, there'd be more fish. It's just a question of how to do it. We need to figure it out. So I'm against all environmental or any kind of subsidies. Government should stay out of economics, out of any economic activity. Um, Sweden. Utopia. <laughs> Where do you start with Sweden? Um, so let me give you a little history of Sweden first, because I think history is important. Uh, between 1870 and about, and, and certainly the Second World War, and, and maybe even until a little bit after the Second World War, Sweden had the most capitalist economy in the world. In the world. It was the freest economically of any country, freer than America. And indeed, during that time, major Swedish industries were created. It, it, was, it was among the richest countries in Europe, maybe, the, I think it was the richest country in Europe on a per capita basis. Uh, some of the biggest companies in Europe were based in Sweden. Their industry was famous. It, 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 it was an incredibly wealthy society. And then around 1960, Sweden decided to become socialist. And so what did they do? They took all the money that had been accumulated by all these families over decades, and they started redistributing it. And they lost their industries, and they lost their lead. By 1979, the biggest industry in Sweden, anybody knows what the biggest revenue industry in Sweden was? ABBA. The rock group. The pop group. ABBA. You know what the second in the largest industry in Sweden was by the late 1970s? Johan Borg, the tennis player. They had decimated their industries. And by 1994, Sweden was basically Greece. It was bankrupt. It couldn't pay its debt. Since 1994 to today, Sweden has been shrinking government spending, reducing regulations, even reducing payouts. It has a voucher system for education, which we don't have in the United States. You can send your kid to any school. Um, and basically, Sweden has become a lot less socialist than it used to be. It still has high taxes, still redistributes a lot, less regulated than the United States. It's easier to open a business in Sweden than in the United States. It's easier to be a banker than in the United States. So first, if it's utopia, it's not a socialist utopia. It's just a different mixture of a mixed economy than America is. So that's one. Uh, Sweden has no free speech. Sweden has hate speech laws. If you paint a painting that people find offensive, you can go to jail. You can look this up on the internet. A Swedish painter about a year ago went to jail for painting an offensive painting. Now, it was offensive. I admit it. Right? He's a, he's a neo-fascist, awful painter. He still don't, shouldn't go to jail for this. Freedom of speech should be sacred. You should be able to say anything. Right? It could be stupid. It could be insensitive. It could be racist. It could be anything. You have a right to say it. People can shun you. People can, t you can not choose not to talk to you. But you can't go to jail for that. In Sweden, you go to jail for it. Uh, somebody uh, put up a YouTube video a couple of months ago. Um, a couple of months ago uh, uh, in Sweden uh, claiming, I, I don't know if you know this, but Sweden has the highest rate of rapes in the Western world, maybe in the world as a total. So somebody went on YouTube and said that that was caused by Muslim migration. I don't know if that's true or not. They were brought in front of a judge. They were taken to court for saying that. And the judge said, I don't care if that's right or wrong, it's insensitive, you can't say it. That's not a utopia in my mind. Uh, Swedish entrepreneurs, if, you, if you're really ambitious, where do you go? 
to America. If I, I always suggest this experiment, and I, I wish somebody would take me up on it. Let's have no immigration controls between Sweden and America, and let's see which way they go. I bet you most of the Swedes go to America. But let's make it hard, because you might say it's because of the weather, they don't want to go to California. <laughs> let's make no immigration controls between Sweden and Minnesota. Minnesota is very cold, and it's where most of the Swedish immigrants live. I bet you they all go to Minnesota, or a lot of them will go to Minnesota. America is a much better place than Sweden. Our homes are bigger, we're richer, we drive nicer cars, we have a higher standard of living by any measure of standard of living. There's no comparison. Sweden, if it was ranked based on states, the wealth of different states, would rank in the lower half of wealth per capita of states in the United States. It's not that rich. We're much richer in America for that. Um, it's more equal. But equality is not, what's, what's a, if, I'd rather be rich than equal. Um, let me, there was one other thing I wanted to say about Sweden. Or would you rather be poor than you? Yeah, I'd rather be poor than equal because then I can rise up. An unequal society provides opportunities for people to rise up. An equal society, you're stuck wherever you happen to be. And if you want, I mean, you should buy my book on inequality, but if you want to know my views on what, why I think the idea of equality of outcomes is the most evil idea in human history, you can ask me. Uh, thank you for a very impressive lecture. Uh, my name is Yuri, and I have the question connected to Sweden uh, about their neighbor, Finland. A few days ago, I read, uh, I read the news that uh, they are planning to introduce so-called basic income for every people in the country, not depending on what they yeah. yeah, so what do I think of basic income? I think it's terrible, because to give them the basic income, you have to take it from somebody. I don't believe in taking money. I don't believe in taking from one person and giving to another. But, it's better than any other welfare program. It's better in America, we have food stamps, we have welfare, we have Medicare, we have a million, a, I mean, I, this is a voucher system, basically. You get money, you spend it any way you want. The government isn't telling you how to spend your money. So, replacing all of welfare with a minimum income, and that's the only welfare you get. You don't get anything else from the government. You get the minimum thing. You want to spend it all on alcohol? Fine, but we're not going to help you once you're drunk. I'm fine, you know. It's a better than what we have today, right? So if you were going to have any kind of welfare system, that's the kind. I still think it's wrong. I think it's, still think it's evil. I think it's wrong to steal from one person and give to another. Um, you know, the example I always use is, if, if my neighbor uh, has no money for food, you know, he's gone bankrupt, he's lost all his money, whatever the reason, his fault, not his fault, whatever, he, he doesn't have any money. He can come to me. And he has two choices. He can ask me to help. And I might help him. If he's a nice guy, and if my kids don't need the money right now, and if I've got a little bit extra, I'll help him. Because I'm a nice guy. Right? I value human life. I, I, I think it's a good thing, and I want to help people be successful. Particularly if he didn't lose it for his own fault. Uh, you know, if he's an innocent victim. Or he can pull a gun out and steal my money. Now, if he gets together with the neighbors and they all vote to take my money, does that make it less than stealing? So if he comes to me with a gun and takes my money, everybody thinks he should go to jail. That's wrong. But if the neighbors vote to take my money, somehow magically we turn stealing into welfare and it's okay. <laughs> I think welfare is stealing. I think it's daylight robbery. And I think the fact that people vote for it it, it, it just makes them complicit in the stealing. So, I don't believe in any redistribution of wealth. Zero. If I want to help somebody, I believe in charity, I believe in free will, I believe people should be charitable for you. Now, remember what I wanted to say about Sweden. One of the things people say about Sweden, it's related. One of the people say about uh, 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 Scandinavia is that they're happy. Every happiness study, yeah. Swedes are happy. <clears throat> so, I have two things to say about that. One is, if you go to Sweden and you ask people if they're happy, everybody expects them to say yes. <laughs> and they say yes. Right? And, and 
you know, they, the studies are sophisticated, they're not that obvious. But generally, if you ask a Swede if they're happy culturally, they're expected to say yes. You know, Swedes, we're happy. The Which is the good. exact yeah. opposite of Ukrainians. Every uh, I was going to give Ukrainian. the example of Jews. Yeah, you ask a Jew if you're happy, and they say yes, then all the other Jews are going to say, you're happy? How can you be happy? <laughs> There's no such thing as happiness. Nobody's happy. You know, the question in, my, this is in Israel, nobody's happy, right? Because everybody's... It's culturally unacceptable to be happy. <laughs> so they're cultural differences. But there's another issue of happiness studies. If you ask Swedes if they're happy, they say yes. But if you ask Swedes in America if they're happy, they're even happier. Sweden's rich. But Swedes in America? Much richer. Because part of the reason Swedes are rich is a certain culture. Culture matters. Some cultures good, some cultures not so good. They have a relatively entrepreneurial, uh, creative culture. They're educated. They're, you know, when they go to America, because there are more opportunities, because there's more freedom, they're even richer than they are in Sweden. Uh, American Swedes live in Wisconsin and Minnesota. They live in big, big homes. They have incredibly comfortable lives, and they're very happy. Even happier than the Swedes who stayed in Sweden. So. All these studies, you have to really, you know, you have to control for the right variables. We do regression analysis in business. The whole point of regression analysis is knowing what to control for. Ninety percent of the studies out there that do econometrics are garbage because they don't do the controls right. It's, it's a tough thing to do. Um, we're going to wrap up, but I want to ask you one more question. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I'm going to say something that's, that's specifically related to Atlas Shrug because when you were talking... Uh, when you were talking about Sweden and you were talking about subsidies and you were talking about the evils of, 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 of taxation and the fact that taxation is, sweet, is, is, is theft, uh, you were basically talking like Francisco, yeah. which is which, who is one of the for those of you that one have read out the shrugs, one of the one of the key one of the key uh, characters. Um, but Atlas Shrugged has an interesting ending to it, and the reason I mention this is because the third volume has just come out in, in Ukrainian translation, and it's about something called Gulch. Gulch. Now, I'm not going to, for those of you that haven't read it, I'm not going to reveal what Galt Gulch is all about. But for those of you that have read it, you're immediately smiling. Um, because it's a pretty special place. Yeah. And one of the things that I've found in, my, in, in this room and in other classrooms where I've talked about, I've talked about Ayn Rand is the, the reaction of many business people that buy into the philosophy of objectivism is, you know what, let's all get together and get the hell out of here. Yeah. Right? Let's all just, I mean, Ukraine is a country that's got all kinds of problems. It needs to fall apart before anything will be done with it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and thankfully, many of the business people in the room will turn around and say, that's a cop out. Yeah. So I guess my question is, is Ayn Rand telling us to cop out? Or what's the message behind, I mean, Galt's Gulch is clearly a literary thing, yeah. right? Yeah. But if we all decide to cop out, then the world collapses. Yep. But it's not your responsibility to hold the world up, <laughs> which, is, which is part of the message of Atlas Shrug. It's, you're, you're not responsible for other people's errors. And, and, and Dagny, who doesn't buy that, who wants to fight on for the world, learns the hard way that the world doesn't want to help and all she's doing is subsidizing evil, subsidizing destruction. And by leaving, she actually makes a bigger impact. But I don't want to give away the ending. But so there are two problems with the response, with the idea of let's all go somewhere else. Where do you go? There is no gold culture. Gold culture is a literary mechanism. It doesn't exist in reality. You can't create it in reality. Um, I, I know billionaires who want to buy an island and start a new country. Nobody's going to let you do that. You know, if you create a country that's too free, guess what will happen? Guess what will happen? If you find an island, you start it, and you, you, you set up a free bank, you know, a bank that will take deposits, has real privacy, all that. What will happen? The Marines will show up. They'll shut you down. Nobody's going to let you do it. I mean, ask the Cayman Islands. Ask Switzerland. Why does the Switzerland have private banking anymore? Real private banking, privacy. Because America told them, you can't do that. And if you do that, we're going to shut you down. We're going to boycott you. We're going to destroy you. So they stop. 
So nobody is good. So you can't create a, a truly free country, and this is why America is so important. Without get you know, without getting in a sense permission, right, from one of these superpowers. I told the guy, I said, you can do that. You can buy the island. You can start the country on one condition: that you buy a nuke with it, and you point it at Washington D.C. and you. You, you prove to them that you'll actually use it. Then they'll leave you alone. But other than that, they'll never leave you alone. I, I mean, I know you've got a big thug that you're dealing with to the east. I deal with a thug in Washington. Not quite as bad, but bad. Still a thug, still politicians, and you've got thugs here and around the corner in Parliament. They're all thugs. Politics is about thuggery. It's about taking money from some people and giving to others in the modern world. It doesn't have to be that way. It shouldn't be that way, but it is that way. Um, so what do you do? I mean, a lot of American businessmen since the financial crisis have said, I've had enough. They shrugged. And uh, they retired. They, they work part-time. They're not willing to pay into the system anymore. They're not willing to make an effort. Some of them even have left and gone to, uh, to uh, Singapore, Hong Kong. I know a guy who says, I'm, leaving, I'm, I'm going to Thailand. Next crisis, I'm up. I'm, I'm, I'm in Thailand. I can't blame them. Your responsibility is to your life. If that's going to lead to the best life possible for you, you should do it. I believe America and the Western civilization can still be saved. <laughs> and maybe that's just because I'm in the business of trying to save it, so I have to believe it can be saved, because otherwise what would be the purpose of my life? Um, so you're more Dagny than John Galton? <laughs> yeah, in a sense. In a sense, I am. And, I, and, and in a sense, I understand Dagny more than I understand John Galton. There's a sense in which I do it. And, and you can see in the characters, for those of you who read the book, Francisco is the one who struggles a little bit, once in a while, right? He just, he, particularly in the beginning, he has a hard time. Um, you know, this world is worth fighting for. It's, it, there's too many good stuff. You know, I, I love, I love life. And I love the world we live in. I love America. I love Silicon Valley. If you haven't noticed, I love Apple. I love that there's a new iPhone every year. I'm not willing to just go into a desert island somewhere and give up my new iPhone. But I love other people. I love being able to engage with people. And I love a lot of people who don't agree with me. Because they're incredibly productive, because they do great things, because they, they, they make wonderful products, because, you know, not this guy, but some of the paint beautiful paintings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm sitting opposite this guy. And I'm like I mean all of them. It's like life is not worth living in that universe. I want to live in I want I mean I have a view of art. I want to live in the universe the painter is painting. I want to be there. I, I want to live in the universe of Michelangelo's David. I even am willing to live in the universe of Michelangelo's Pietà. Because it's heroic and it's beautiful. And it's a mother caring for her child. Put aside any religious element. That's the world I want to live in. I want, I want to live in the world of, of 19th century paintings, of, of romantic, you know. Uh, that's the and, and this stuff is there. I want to run away. Um, <laughs> You know, I want to live in the, in, 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 in the world of, of great romantic music, of passion, of excitement, of fun, of adventure. That's the kind of world I want to live in. Uh, and there's a lot of adventure and fun in the world as it is today. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to go with five of my best friends to some isolated place. I, I, I love you guys too much in a sense. I mean, I, I, love the, I love the interchange, I love the exchange, I love what you do with your lives and the products that you produce that make my life better. And, and this is why, and I'll ask a question of myself, like, a lot of times objectivists are, are critiqued as, you're cold-hearted, you don't care about other people, and you don't care about the poor. No! I love poor people who are ambitious, and I would actually help them in a free country. I, I love people generally, I love human life, I love the idea of human life, I love little babies, because I love the potential that they have to become fully flourishing human beings. Objectivists are lovers. That's how I perceive it. Objectivism is the philosophy of love. It's about loving yourself. It's about loving life. And if you love yourself and you love life, you love human beings. Not, not evil human beings. You have to, to be able to do that, you have to say, Hitler was evil. These people are evil. They're bad. They should be gone, right? These people are not. They, they produce beautiful things. They create wonderful stuff. They, they live. They're passionate. That's great. So you have to be judgmental, but the focus is on love. To, to, to be able to truly love, you also have to be able to truly hate. You, you can't have one without the other. 
because you have to appreciate the value and you have to appreciate this value. You know, you, you, it's a lot. I think you defined, you defined objectivism in a new way for me, and that's, yep. called, and that's called judgmental optimism. <laughs> or optimistic, optimistic judgmentalism. Yeah, yeah. Right? Or, 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 you know, I like to call it a philosophy of love because love involves judgment, right? You don't love everybody, you and you love you love some people a little bit. You love hopefully your spouse a lot, right? And and I've been lucky. I've been I've been married 32 years, and two kids, and I'm a lover. I believe in love, uh, and 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 it's 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 about life. That's what it's about. That philosophy. I might call it a philosophy, and I'll end with this. Ayn Rand called a philosophy a philosophy for living on this earth. A philosophy for living on this earth. That, that to me is what it's all about. Live. I want to thank you very much for coming tonight, and I want to thank particularly Aaron for uh, an, an inspiring session.